We're back at the Minotaur Hotel. This was supposed to be the last video of 2020, but I got it all busy, so it's the first video of 2021 instead. And the Tennis Ace video I'd planned to do today will be next week instead, so don't worry, Shuichi fans. His video will be coming up next week. And for now, let's carry on with where we left things off. We look at the scene in Hades and meet the ferryman. It was like the end of a summer's day's rain back at the Palace of Knossos. Rivulets fall into the patio's stone floor, droplets pouring from the trees down to the saffron bushes. The pitter-patter of fat droplets and children's feet as the Minotaur sat by the tall red pillars, thinking, not making a noise. Thinking, as his father told him to, as he did now. He had walked a dozen steps downhill before he lost balance and fell to his knees. Now he sat, collecting himself. The Minotaur looked up to the stony ceiling hundreds of feet above him, raining down the same fat drops of water on his muzzle. His neck hurt as if a searing iron wire had burnt it. His tongue and throat were locked frozen by a lump on his neck. Mysterion thought, and thought well as he plucked and then cradled an asphodel flower in his hands. He was surrounded by them in this meadow overlooking a labyrinthine land of rivers. His body ached, but how soft a flower's petals are against one's hand. Its white and pink were like a slash of life in this darkened land. How long did he stay there in the Asphodel field? He lost track of time, but he remembers the moment he rose, when he caught himself humming. A nameless, graceless tune coming from deep within him. A cold drop fell on the palm of his hand, and the Minotaur was awoken from his trance. Prince Asterion, adopted son of King Minos of Crete, rose and looked down towards the rivers. And there he was, the man waiting by the shore. This time he stomped downhill, letting the slope guide him in leaps and bounds. He could not laugh, the lump in his throat made sure of that, but splayed on his muzzle was a smile. When the slope ended, he let momentum carry him to the shore, to the skeletal man in his humble boat. Never before had Asterion seen such a sordid creature. His beard, drier than hay and caked with foul filth, went down to the muddy shore. His feet, half sunk in the mud, had overgrown yellowed nails, though more like fangs than what any human should have. A coarse cloak covered the upper half of his face. As he shifted on his feet, Asterion caught a glimpse of the old man's eyes. They burned. The man was hollow like a furnace, and reeked of bitter smoke. Foul was the god on the river shore, and common was it for nobles and highborn to shy away from him. Judging by Asterion's smile, however, one would guess he beheld a holy envoy covered in fine garments and fragrant with the scent of flowers. Asterion's hooves sank into the muddy soil of the river as the old god's gaze crawled over the hybrid. Sensing movement, half a dozen crabs which had hidden in the mud skittered away from the two of them. What a peculiar sight! Not a man and not a beast, much less an immortal. Neither a mournful youth nor a pacified elder. A smiling newly dead, one leaping downhill like a nymph. Now, let me collect my payment. With his left hand, the foul-smelling elder supported the minotaur's neck and massaged a lump within it with a bony thumb. With his other hand, he reached into Asterion's mouth and plucked the obstruction from his throat like a child would pluck a flower. It was a gold coin, so freshly minted it shone like an ember. You must have had a good friend, young hybrid. This will do well. Now tell me, what is your lineage, hybrid son? Words flowed from his lips like honey. The Minotaur's heart pranced like a newborn foal and his face regained some of its colour. I am the son of earth and foamy sea, but my race is starry, heavenly. My name is Asterion. Lord Charon, may I cross the river to my place of rest? 
The old man ran a slender finger over his matted beard as he looked the newly dead up and down. Very well, come. We shall cross the rivers. It shall be a scenic ride for you, for such a bountiful payment. Ah, what a day. A newly dead beaming with life, heavenly blood in the corpse of a beast, a cursed being with gold to spare. Tell me, boy, why the joy? It is fair that the bud plucked before spring cursed a hand which left it to wither. Yet I see no vinegar, only honey and wine. Asterion sat on the boat, his back to the man. He looked ahead to the distant shore. The fire in his chest kept him warm. He did not bother responding to the old god's question. Chapter 10 The Bedrock There are rules for placing cutlery. Forks to the left, knives to the right, with the first set placed on the outside. Spoons are placed to the right of knives. The basics are simple, but it's easy to get it wrong if you forget what kind of fork is meant for which meal. In the end, however, it doesn't matter. Very few sit at the dinner table for its sparkling cutlery first and food second, after all. But today, even if for just a moment, silverware seems like a matter of colossal importance. Asterion ignores the cheese and crackers, cured meats and boiled eggs, jams and pastries. His eyes are locked on your spoon, the disgraceful thing he placed on the wrong side of the plate. Fat drops of sweat run from his forehead to chin, then drip down onto his lap. You can hear a rumble coming from him. A drawn-out grunt of distress followed by the minotaur hunching over you. He woke up different today. Stumbling about and skittish, already second-guessing the choice to have breakfast with you. But he wouldn't back down on his word. Now his distress is carved onto his face. You let go of your buttered bread and smile at him. It wouldn't do any good to make him any more nervous with probing Francis. You'll need to be delicate. Is something the matter, Asterion? You look sick. The Minotaur's eyes shift down to his plate. He recoils further into a compacted ball of fur, his hands clasped above his legs. Asterion's unease crawls over to you and gnaws away to your confidence over this situation. Such a simple thing, a breakfast. Just last night he had a contagious smile when he accused you of harbouring a honey tongue. Perhaps it was the wine. The idea must have pleased him then, for in sobriety all of a man's shame returns with a vengeance. You look for something to say. Is there even any combination of words that can pull the two of you from this bog? Just how far can words go against tragedy in a man's life? Asterion remains with his hands locked in his lap, gazed down as if in deference. There's no great wisdom that can pull him, but perhaps honesty can offer some relief. He shouldn't feel bad. His gaze returns to your cutlery, to the disgraceful spoon, then back to himself. I'm not talking about the spoon. You don't deserve to go through this kind of distress, at all. We had fun last night, didn't we? Nothing's changed since then. You had an enjoyable dinner with the other guests. You and I were at the same table. The one difference is this time that both of us are eating together. He looks off to the side and grinds his teeth. Well, I feel very inadequate. This experience is very unsettling to me. Why? As I said last night, I never had a proper meal with the master. And the spoon. Oh, I put it in the wrong place. About the spoon, what can we do to solve it? It's too late. It's in the wrong place already. But can it be fixed? Oh, I suppose so. You pick the spoon up and put it in its correct place, to the right of the knives. There, fixed. One less reason for you to be nervous. Is there anything else bothering you? You can tell me. He lets out a drawn out sigh. It sounds defeated at first, but his shoulders are relaxed and his eyes are half closed. Ah, uh, I sometimes forget. Master is not one who would go for physical punishment. I shall outgrow that fear. Worry not. 
besides feeling inadequate, I realise now that oh, I don't want you to see me struggling with the cutlery, and I can't shake the feeling you'll be angry with me. Angry because you struggle with a knife and fork? And then what would happen? Oh, I don't know. Maybe the master would think less of me, seeing me for what I am. I don't think any less of you. You take a bite. Why do you struggle with cutlery? Did no one ever teach you? I just never needed to learn as I grew up, or for a long time after, as a matter of fact. It wasn't until a few centuries ago that I even saw forks. It was a novelty then. People have tried teaching me, but I struggle with fine movements. I prefer eating with my hands. Well then, do just that. There's no issue with it. But it would be undignified of me to expose myself this way, and... The times really have changed, haven't they? Is all this distress for nothing? Yes. It's hard for me to understand why you're so nervous. Nothing of what you've done today, even since I arrived at the hotel, deserves any bad reaction. But if you want to use cutlery, then try it. There's no problem if you get it wrong or make a mess. The Minotaur takes the precious silverware in his hands. And there is no way this is going to end well. You hadn't stopped to watch before, but... Asterion's clumsiness with small objects is nothing short of a crime. One can't help but feel the urge to leap out and guide his hand, but this is a challenge he must overcome himself. The silverware is so thin, he has a hard time keeping it between his thick fingers. It keeps slipping around his hand as well. Overall, Asterion's troubled relationship with silverware follows a three-act structure. First, he reacquaints his fingers with the thin metal. His hands quiver like long-lost lovers, touching lips together for the first time in ages. There is an attempt at gracefulness, like teenagers fumbling around in the moment of passion. For a glorious split second he holds it properly, and then the fork slips as he puts pressure on a piece of cheese. In the second act things take a turn for the worse. As the Minotaur again becomes distressed he forgets how cutlery is meant to be held. It grips it like two pens, or perhaps like a pair of scalpel and pincers. It goes well for half a minute before the fork slips and falls into his glass of orange juice. The fork pleads for help for the hand of his precious lover. Blasterion's mind has turned cold along the river of sweat running down his back and matting his shirt. The tragedy arrives in the play's third act. Our once plucky hero is consumed by grief, wrath, hubris. The gods have given up on him much like he did on love. As if you don't exist, as if dignity was an alien concept, a stare on holes and knife and fork, sticky with juice, like a child, gripping the handle as if he was ready to stab the miserable cur de splayed upon his plate. And there he goes. The battle for the breakfast is over and he's about to enjoy his single slice of cheese. It costs his dignity, that is a small price to pay for sustenance. But the humiliation never ends, for the cheese was sliced too thin. It tears and drops into his lap, staining his clothes further. With a greasy plap as it falls to the floor, the tragedy draws to a close. How much abuse can a ta man take before snapping? How unfair can the world be? In other periods of human history, trauma as profound as this would surely push any man to take arms against creation it's itself. Not Asterion, however. The Minotaur, disgraced creature, is left with one outlet. <coughs> Did you just... moo? Asterion looks up, his face awash with shame and cringe. He slumps in utter defeat, an errant hand knocking a nearby apple off the table. By the gods, what a wretched day. The Minotaur looks away from you. I'm sorry, I think I misheard you. I could swear you uh, said moo. Yes, I sometimes do it uh, when I... Yeah, if there's too much... Why, well, it gets too much. 
It's like being in the middle of a storm. I get lost and I can't always hold it. And then it happens. I... I let out a moo. That's adorable. Uh, excuse me, but what did you just say? It's adorable. I didn't know you did that. A drop cup of coffee's contents crawl their way to the table's edge. A droplet is pushed out. Two. Then it becomes a stream that cascades down the floor just beside your foot. Before the cup can roll off as well, you push it back up with just his finger, as not to bring Asterion's attention to it. Why is it adorable? It just is. You may not agree, but it is adorable. The Minotaur groans. You take the opportunity to lay your foot over the pesky apples it attempts to roll away. You put it back to yourself and press it against the side of your chair. A few drops run down the side of the orange juice cup. A petal the size of a fingerprint is at its base. Somehow I find that hard to believe. Come on, it's a compliment. Why would anyone compliment me? What is there to say? I can't even hold a fork like a person. Don't be like that. You were great. Just last night we had so much fun. I very much enjoyed your company. And you dealt so well with Greta's questions. You have a way with tough situations. Ah, oh, it can't be. The master must be teasing me. A fat chance. I'm being honest here. Your words, however, don't seem to have much of an effect. You might need to do something a little bit better to cheer him up. You look back to the battlefield on top of the table. Puddles of orange juice, a slice of cheese draped over a cup of coffee, jam over the cured meats, grease stains strewn all around Asterion's side. It is, however, no messier than what you'd see on a rowdy night out in a bar with friends. And the food, for the most part, should still be safe to eat. With four slices of bread and what remains of the cheese and cured meats, with the jam scraped off, you make two basic sandwiches. You do make sure to pack them as much as possible before the thing falls off from the sides. This will be all you'll eat. You might as well make it plentiful. What do you say we leave this whole mess behind us? Enjoy this for our breakfast. No need for cutlery here. The mining tall clenches his jaws as he accepts your offer. He turns a bit to the side, avoiding your gaze, and you follow suit. The living room fills with the sound of your chewing, interrupted once or twice when Asteron reaches out for his cup of juice. The sandwiches, of all things, break the air of tension in the room. What is left of the jam on the meat adds an unexpected twist to its salty taste, balanced by the cheese's neutral flavour. If you take another bite, you give the Minotaur a sideways glance, and find him looking back to you, then averting his gaze. You look to the window, the horizon of orange and blue, then back to Asterion. This time he is the one who catches your gaze, but neither of you look away. You hunch over, elbows supported on your knees. Just then you hear the swish of the Minotaur's tail against the ground. Well, thank you, and the sandwich is good. You're welcome. You know, I could make us more sandwiches now and then. Asterion opens his mouth to say something, but changes his mind. Instead, he grunts and looks away to finish his meal. Once it's done, he relaxes a bit, resting his hands between his legs, almost staining his pants with a mess of jam, orange juice and cheese oil on them. You want help with that? Asterion jerks his tail, twitches his ears and lets out a rumble from his chest. His legs shift, hooves scrape against the floor, but he nods. He extends his left hand to lay it over yours. The fur on his back is short, but on his knuckles and on the side opposite to his thumb there are scruffy patches, thicker, about a centimetre longer. It is smooth and firm fur, as one might expect from his bovine heritage. And just below that thin layer there is his hand, wholly human in shape. The nails, however, are black and thicker than any of you ever seen. You take a napkin with your left hand. You clean between his fingers, his forearm tenses, and sends contractions all the way to the palm of his hand and tip of his fingers. Like a cat's paw contracting over his owner's finger, all of Asterion's fingers twitch and curl at once, trapping your hand in his grasp. His palm is sweaty, and the beating of his heart makes itself known despite his coarse, thick skin. 
Just as you look up to him, you feel the fur at his wrist standing on end, followed by a rumble crawling from his chest all the way to your hand. Ah, uh, uh, I'm sorry. He let your hand go with the same deliberate glacial pace he trapped it in the first place. Just as he lets you go, his fingers follow yours before stopping. You could swear his breathing quickened. There's no doubt he scoots his chair closer to you. When you reach in further to clean the final weapon of his fingers, you feel a certain resistance. Asterion's gaze drills into his own hand. He tries to pry his fingers further apart to grant you better access, but it's as if his nerves are made of stone. His fingers shudder and tremble. The minotaur sighs and grunts each time he tries to mould his hand to ease your work. Last, you clean the palm of his hand, and, just as your napkin grazes the centre where the lines meet, or his fingers curl up again. Its movements are twitchy, more like an involuntary and uncoordinated reflex than a willful act. Well, I can't control it. When you touch it like that, it just closes on reflex. I see. I'm sure I'm learning a lot about your hands today. Well, I suppose you are. He opens his hand once more, then you hover a finger over the palm, threatening to touch it. Asterion's gaze shows no opposition to what you're about to do. You graze the tip of your finger, slow enough to let your nail caress the hills and valleys with his handprint. The Minotaur's hand clutches yours, but this time your deliberateness gifted Asterion with some of his own. His fingers rest between your knuckles, with his pinky hanging off to the side. He mutters something under his breath. When you look up to his face, you find his gaze lost, his chest bouncing up and down in shallow breaths. You budge a bit, but he doesn't want to let go. And in fact, there was just a tiny bit of pressure, so he wanted to nudge your fingers apart to entwine them with his. Something like a mew escapes his throat, although he seems none the wiser about it. And you doubted me when I said you were adorable. Um... He's in a whole different world. The sensation not at all unpleasant, if one doesn't mind his sweaty palm. In fact, having such a larger hand holding yours feels like being a child once more. Again, you try to open your hand, and this time he complies. But you don't disengage. With such a youthful spirit taking over your mind, an idea springs forth. Before your hands separate, you pull him back to entwine your fingers once more, with your thumbs pointing up this time. Have you ever played thumb wrestling? Is that a thing people used to do? Huh? Thumb wrestling? Yeah, it's a game kids play nowadays. By nowadays, I mean I played when I was in school. It's not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination. We hold hands like this, and... You demonstrate by trying to pin his thumb down. Though it's an unfair match from the get-go. His hand is like a Goliath to your David. Then we try to pin each other's thumb, just like wrestling. I see. Except he doesn't. The first round the two of you play is defined by his passivity and lack of quick reflexes. During the second one, he fares better. He puts up more of a fight. When it comes down to a contest of strength, he lets you win without much opposition. He's getting focused on the task, however. His breathing returns to regularity and his eyes regain some sharpness. Are you going easy on me? Come on, put up some resistance. Uh, okay. How about this? This time Goliath crushes the competition. Asterion's thumb crashes on top of yours and overpowers you. Yeah, like that? Yeah, now, how about best out of three? His hand may be bigger than yours and covered in fur, and his nails may be dark like coal, but while indulging in such childish playtime, it's easy to let the world melt away around you. What games did Asterion play when he was a kid? Thumb wrestling may not have been one of them, but it awakens something in him nonetheless. He laughs, giggles, flicks his ears and thrashes his tail around. It's hard to say for sure, but even his cheeks seem a little flushed now. These intervals of childish wonder cannot last long, however. The living room is still a mess. After your playtime, Asterion won. The two of you tidy up the place, carrying still the soreness in your cheeks that comes when one laughs too much. At times he offers you an unashamed glance, with no attempt of hiding it. Would Master believe me if I said you remind me 
of an old friend. Really? What was he like? Perhaps that is a matter for another time. We do have our duties to attend to, do we not? And I have a mess to clean up as well. You take a good look at the floor. I am afraid you are right. In fact, we have a special mission for today, one of exceptional importance. Is that so? Now what does my wise lord have in mind? Well, do you remember our conversation last night about the internet? That's what we need to do, connect this lonesome place to the outside world. Nowadays all guests expect to have an internet connection wherever they stop by a hotel. We need to keep up with modern times. Ah yes, I remember now. You wish then for me to take you to that place I told you about. Very well. Is the master ready? May we proceed? Yes, let's go. Asterion walks to the door leading back to the stairway, but stops. You hear the faintest sound. Is he humming? Then the door clicks, and what you see outside is nothing like the inviting light from the stairway. A tunnel stretches ahead of you, sloping down. Its walls are raw, bare stone. Asteron walks in as if nothing out of the ordinary what just happened. He gives you only a brief glance, inviting you to follow. Soon as you cross the doorway, the very air around you changes. A bitter dampness hits you like a truck. It pries your mouth open and burns its way into your lungs. The entire hotel so far had air so dry it could make your nose bleed. But this place was already covering your skin in a sweat, sheet of sweat and grime. Just being here makes you feel dirty. But a stair on keeps going, and you follow along a few feet behind. The light from the doorway behind you grows dimmer, and the farther you go, the louder the minotaur's hoofsteps. The two of you travel a labyrinthine set of twists and turns, with each shift the walls change further into polished rock. The air worsens to such an extent that you have to make an effort not to cough. Regardless, your tongue is covered by a bitter oil that you can neither swallow nor spit out. The harsh sound of Asterion's hooves against stone, echoing all the way down the corridor, is both an invitation to proceed and an unnatural sound pushing you out of this place. That is, until the Minotaur steps on something brittle. You drag your feet along the floor, can feel the texture of the stone change. Its former smoothness has given way to a rougher, harsher surface that scrapes against your soles. The claustrophobic corridors give way to a large chamber. It is darker than any room you've seen in the hotel thus far, save perhaps from the cold room. The lights from some source you can't quite determine still allows you to examine the chamber in full detail. The polished stone floor and walls, even outside the doorway leading to the previous corridors, are covered with a thin layer of purple dust. The layers get thicker and thicker as your eyes follow them to the centre of the room, where a large wall of crystalline rock in that same dark colour cuts the room in half. To the right and left there are two large wooden tables, on which a number of people could have worked together. Their legs are also covered in purple dust, and seem to be stuck to the floor by growths of crystal. Books, sketches, documents and schematics are strewn across the tables, and an old vase holding writing quills fashioned out of peacock feathers sits among the mess. Stone columns along the walls support the shadowed ceiling. They too are covered in dust, but the red and black paint that lies underneath is bright and fresh. The middle portion of the room's floor is peculiar. It seems to have been a shallow pool once, a foot deeper than the floor around it but now it's dried and covered by thick outgrowths of purple rock. The very centre of the chamber is a wide basin consumed by the same rock. This is it. We call this place the bedrock. The stone you see is a form of obsidian. This place is as old as the labyrinth. It has always existed. You rub your hand on the crystal wall. The stone is brittle and with the flick of your finger you break off a shard. Just rubbing it between your fingers turns into a coarse powder that sucks up the hair's humidity. As you proceed to examine it, you feel that the stain it leaves on your hand is irregular. There are oily black spots and watery red blotches. 
my lord, that... Oh, it's dirty, covered in centuries-old dust and grime. For your own good, I would advise against touching the obsidian. Oh, good thinking. You rub your hand on your shirt. Thank you. I'd rather not see the master coming in contact with impure substances. I'd further recommend you change clothes once we return. Minotaur takes a step towards you, stand between you and the wall of dark crystals. Uh, may we proceed? The basin at the centre of the room, that's what we use for the radio. This is the equipment that broadcasts radio signals. Oh, I suppose that is a way to put it. A more appropriate description it is the realm's link to the outside world. You take a look into the basin. It's hard to know for sure since it's covered in dark stone. But it is almost as if there's no bottom to it. This room is the closest place to the outside world, if we can say that. It operates by different rules. Millennia ago it was a shrine to the god Hermes, patron of trade and messengers. There are other such locations in this realm dedicated to specific gods. The masters for a long time used it as a dock to send and receive goods from the outside world. Then it became a post room when the hotel was established. If you can offer adequate instructions, it will find a way to transport goods back and forth. It could receive radio signals from the outside after we instructed it on how they work. If you can describe how the internet works, then it can be done. That will connect the realm to the... whatever the internet is. Then, if it's anything like radio, it can retransmit signals to your... equipments. Hmm... And how, we can, how can we teach it to do that? What is the procedure? A contract. Yes, everything in this realm works by means of contracts, many of those signed by the Master. Your will, save a few exceptions, is sovereign. In a single contract we can describe how the internet works, and then command the hotel, through the basin, to connect to it. Hey, that's kind of like programming a computer. Pardon? It's how computers work, that's what I mean. They follow your instructions, nothing more. If you give a computer bad instructions, they won't work. You need to be very precise, tell it step by step, in its own language, what it needs to do. Yes, I suppose your comparison is adequate. That indeed is how the hotel works. Which reminds me, I have yet to offer you the instruction on how to summon objects, don't I? Yes, I've been here a few days already, and yeah, I'd really like it if you could help with that. I am frightfully sorry for my negligence, my lord. Had it not been for the exceptional circumstances under which we met, I would have taught you on your very first day as master. Don't worry about that. Then tell me, how does it work? Very well. For starters, the labyrinth can generate most materials and substances found in nature. That includes animal and plant products. It can generate living beings as well. But, for a number of reasons, that function was disabled. It's a long story. We can discuss it at another time. The labyrinth can generate complex structures and manufactured objects, if you can instruct it on how said thing can be built with raw materials. For clothing, we have quite the archive of instructions. You can trust the hotel to manufacture even complex garments without issue. It cannot, however, fabricate currency. Neither will it produce metals like gold or silver in large quantities, and a few other substances which were used in commerce back when the realm was created. And if a large mass of goods produced by the labyrinth are exported to the outside world, it may become rebellious and refuse to obey orders for a while. The gods put these restrictions in place to stop mortals from using the labyrinth for profit. I see, but that's not an effective restriction, is it? I can imagine a number of ways that could be sidestepped if I wanted a profit. We can't make gold and silver, sure, but what about precious gems? Those are valuable enough that we could ex export a small amount for a high profit. Ah, yes, good catch. That is what we used to do, in fact. We had a contact on the outside who would receive our gems, sell them without leaving a trace, and send over the currency. That way we could pay our employees, and we were not at all stingy, I might add. Interesting. So this whole system is, shall we say, abusable? 
Yes, my lord, there is no doubt about that. After all, is that not what enabled us to build this establishment? The gods sentenced me to eternal damnation, but we found a way to make something good out of it. And we accomplished it by, shall we say, being quite creative and light-footed when interpreting the base rules they established. This is no different from how we managed to bring radio to the hotel. I doubt Hermes ever imagined the uses we could come up with for his shrine. It is fortunate the gods were, shall we say, quite sloppy with how they worded the rules for this realm. Ah, uh, there is one more thing. The labyrinth can muster materials, but as I said, it needs the instructions on how to put them together. Or things such as books. It can copy books which already exist here, but it cannot summon a book it does not know. With that said, may I teach my lord how the summoning is done? Yes, I'm ready. Let's do it. It is a simple affair. Ah, perhaps you shall find it silly. But believe me, for this task you need only... Hum, uh, this song in particular. Mine it all begins humming a slow and drawn-out melody. Asterion's humming at time quivers, lingers, stretches itself. The song itself is simple, easy to learn and quite unlike what you'd hear from modern musicians. Although he does not sing any lyrics, it would seem he's thinking of them and humming in unison. After repeating the strong two more times, he stops. We need to call out to the labyrinth, inform it we are making a demand. We required an unequivocal gesture. Over the centuries, the masters have employed a number of actions for this, such as snapping their fingers or tapping their feet. But my lord can imagine how problematic it was when they had unwittingly give commands to the hotel. So, for a few centuries now, we have adopted this song as a gesture. Master need only hum it. With time we will even be able to do it without anyone noticing. If I am around, I can hum it for you as well. That worked just the same. I hummed in your stead when you tried summoning clothes for me. And now, state what it is you desire. You repeat the song Asterion just hummed, and... You think of something simple you can summon to test a labyrinth's abilities. Perhaps a small gift for the Minotaur. You picture a small wristband. If the labyrinth can summon kitchen equipment or modern articles of clothing, something simple like some beads and strings shouldn't be difficult to make. You close your eyes and hum the same tune as Steron did earlier. You feel the familiar shift into the lights in the room. This time the tile floor vibrates under your feet as well. The dark rocks around you crackle, like charcoal clacking together its poured on a bonfire. Then you jolt at the sensation of the rocks shattering and pouring over you. When you open your eyes the wall is intact and unchanged. Perhaps because you're so deep in the heart of the labyrinth within its lowest layer. And there it is. It's not a complex design at all. Just some black wooden beads and metallic rings with a string running through them. Asterion looks at what you made and smiles. Well, not bad for your first try. You look back at the Minotaur and take his hand. He goes limp in your touch. You feel his entire body relax as you tie the wristband for him. Uh, uh, thank you, Master. Does it suit me? Yes, looks great. All right, enough messing around. How about we get started on the internet thing? Where do we even start? Asterion excuses himself to go back into the tangled hallways and returns a few minutes later with a folder full of schematics. He lays them over the two tables. Asterion lets you skim through un uninterrupted. You cannot make sense of them. It's a jumbled mess of geometric drawings and calculations. For the next hour, you and Asterion try to crack the puzzle. He explains to you how a team decades ago made these schematics to translate a radio's function into the hotel's bedrock. And you, in turn, try to explain to the best of your abilities how the internet works. It becomes apparent that, no matter your previous expertise, there is so much about the nitty-gritty of the internet's workings that you can't describe from memory. This will take quite a bit of research. If it's just you and Asterion, it would take days or weeks to accomplish it. 
Your concentration is broken when you hear the shadow of rock moving against itself just behind you. You turn around, but nothing has changed. It's still the same dark, humid room. There's something the matter. I could have sworn I heard something move behind me. I'm afraid I heard nothing, my lord. Perhaps you are just getting tired. That may be the case. Would you mind if we took a little break? Yes, about that. Would Master be willing to carry out an impertinent suggestion from this servant? Before you have a chance to respond, he lets out a giggle. Oh, I'm just pulling your leg. I assume you're about to tell me not to call myself a servant in that manner. I can be witty too, my almighty lord. No, I get him to the point. You see, it is somewhat late in the morning, and new guests might arrive soon. If the both of us stay here to work on this task, then who will greet them in the lobby? The process of drafting the contract requires a great deal of specific knowledge, so I should stay here to do it. Could we perhaps recruit Kota to assist me while you man the reception? That sounds reasonable. I'm not sure he knows a lot about the internet, but he might be able to give you a hand to a certain extent. And we're going to skip the tutorial because I don't think you guys really want to watch it. It's worth going through though. Very well, my lord. I shall realise your will post-haste. I shall summon Kota for his help. <laughs> With that, you head out. Just as you're leaving, you hear it again. The sound of rock rolling against itself right behind you, beyond your grasp. It's just about time for new guests to arrive. Back at the reception, you put on your best smile and wait. Things are slower today. During the morning, only three new guests arrive, all singles. As the day progresses, however, you do notice some commotion as people move about. At lunchtime, you find only a few sandwiches sitting on the lounge's counter. A number of guests are missing. Greta, her boyfriend, and the South American men. As you're having your lunch, you see what could soon become a, a usual sight of the hotel. Luke coming into the restaurant, looking around for a moment, and, if there's no side of Kota, heading straight to the counter to grab some food. Before he's made it out of the room and back towards reception, Luke has already unwrapped one of the sandwiches and split it in half with his talons. He opens his beak wide, so much so that it looks wrong, and swallows the portion whole. As much as you wish he and Kota would get along, you're somewhat happy to be spared the spectacle. You can see this becoming a somewhat sad routine. You prepared yourself for an uneventful afternoon, but when you return to the reception, something feels off. You hear a subtle noise from behind the counter. You walk towards it and peek behind, only to find... Excuse me, but who are you and what do you think you're doing? Oh, uh, sorry. I was just uh, looking for a quiet place. Uh, my name is Ismail. And you chose to sit behind the reception counter? Y yes, uh, it doesn't make sense, huh? It's more that I want to be by myself for a while. And again, you chose to be by yourself behind the reception counter? Of all the places in the hotel, this is the location you chose? Yes, <laughs> isn't it silly? Uh, please understand, I've been hitchhiking with my girlfriend for weeks now and she doesn't stop talking. And today she I got all excited about this thing she was helping with. The fat dragon convinced her to help out with something. When I stumbled into her during lunch, she was all hyped up. You don't understand what she's like. She'll keep going on and on, even when I'm trying to sleep. Please, let me hide. She'll never look here. I'm just watching some anime. I won't get in your way. Anime? How are you doing that? We don't have an internet connection here. I doubt you get any reception. Ah, uh, yeah. It's been driving me crazy. I can't browse shit. I've planned ahead. I have over 108 gigabytes of anime on my phone. It'll have to last the whole trip. Jeez, do you even like Greta? 
I, I don't know if she'd talk so much I can't even think. Thought I'd have some peace and quiet on this trip, but I was wrong. It was a mistake. I thought having a girlfriend would be fun and my buddies from the Polytechnic would stop mocking me. But having a relationship is hard. And she keeps asking me what I think and I don't know. There was this one time she asked if I wanted to have kids after she finishes her doctorate and, and I just want to go home after my shift and chill, man. Huh, you tried talking to her about this. I don't want to talk. Can't you just be quiet? I worked so hard and the polytechnic was so difficult. She should understand that I need my alone time. You poor little creature. I can't imagine what you must be going through. You must be so tired. Well, well I'll let you do your thing then. Hey, hey, do you have a moment to just have a chat? Hmm? I thought you wanted peace and quiet. Well, what I've been praying for is Greta going quiet for a minute or two. If it's another human being, it's okay. I haven't talked with anyone else for over a week. I guess. Uh, what do you want to chat about? I don't know. Just stuff, I guess. Got any favourite anime? Uh, about that... Go for this one because I know nothing about anime. Sorry, anime is not my thing. Oh, you sure? Again, I've got like a ton right here. And it's like, sure they, like seriously, like think Greta comes. Do you think it? <laughs> There's no way I can keep up with this. Uh, no, thank you. I'll pass. Ismail looks disappointed. No, I get you. It's not for everyone. I don't worry about it. Ismail puts his headphones back on and goes back behind the counter. Just don't tell Greta I'm here, all right? You shrug and move on. After that brief episode, the afternoon is uneventful. A handful more guests check in. At 7pm, you make way, your way to the lounge for dinner. Guests have already arrived and settled in to wait for their meals. I stare on the German lady talking as they sit together at a table near the back. Or you can make a way over to talk with them, Kota approaches you. The dragon fidgets with his fingers, readjusts his hair, then grumbles under his breath before speaking. Uh, good evening, Mr. Leo. I'm pleased to see you again. It has been quite a difficult day, to say the least. Please don't get me wrong. I am more than happy to help with the hotel as much as I can, but I must admit technology is not my strong suit. In truth, there have been moments throughout the years where I've been hesitant to get with the times. It got worse after the Second World War. Since then, it's been an endless barrage of advancements. Oh, I'm not so young anymore. I can't keep up with that kind of pace. But I've made peace with the fact that I should at least try to stay up to date with current trends. So, considering I have a hard time operating a smartphone, I'm afraid I was unable to help very much with the task at hand. As such, Asteron and I were unable to make any progress ourselves. However... And please excuse me for tooting my own horn for a second. I had an idea that ended up helping more than I ever could. You see, I had a most, let us say, interesting conversation with Miss Greta yesterday while I was helping her significant other act like an adult. As it turns out, she's an engineer, and when I invited her to inspect the basin, she was more than eager to help. Now, Steyer and I were both very impressed with her contributions. I do believe we are a little closer to unravelling this problem. She went through the trouble of explaining everything. We had a very quick pace, might I add, which got on my nerves after a while. But I do feel like I managed to grasp some of it. And speaking of getting on my nerves, I don't know what it is, but there was something off about that room into which we had to cram ourselves. Everything about it felt wrong. I suppose Mr. Asteron's used to it, and Miss Greta seemed too involved with the project to mind. But something about that room left me on edge. It goes so far as giving me heartburn. And between that and Miss Greta's enthusiasm, I'm afraid say that I had a very stressful afternoon. So, I am sure you understand when I say that I yearn of some peace and quiet right now. I'll be heading to the kitchen. Uh, something very soothing about preparing ramen. I do expect you to be here on time. You will not want to miss it. Uh, stay on Greta, right over there if you need them. 
you head towards Asterion and Greta. Absolutely fantastic. What you have, you could revolutionise, well, everything. You can just make matter out of thin air. This breaks thermodynamics as we know it. We could solve the energy crisis and end scarcity itself forever. This, this place could change the future of the planet. Where were you in this hotel all this time? Why has no one put this place to good use? Oh, Miss Greta, please contain yourself. The hotel remained abandoned for decades. There was nothing I could do. Still, I have been... I mean, my family has pushed towards this for quite a while now, to put this realm to good use. But the previous owners didn't think to put in the effort. At most, they would approve a handful of book shipments every year. That is just absurd. Imagine how we could solve the scarcity of resources. Well, there was good reason not to interfere often with the outside world. This has been the hotel's protocol for centuries now. A while before World War II, there was an incident. Back then, the master was one Jean-Marie. He had a brother called Clément. Clément spent years lobbying to have the hotel supply raw materials to Germany, to Master Jean-Marie Chagrin. Materials such as textiles, iron ore, quicklime. Oh, oh, that is not good. Yes, can you imagine what sort of contraption Germany might have crafted with those materials? Well, I'm glad we played our small but important role in avoiding that altogether. Yes, oh, God. So, you see, quite often masters were afraid of how the hotel's capacities could be misused. With reason. And it's not as simple as one would imagine. The realm cannot export much. It will stop generating new materials if too much mass leaves it. I see, so there's a good reason not to export. But it still can be used for research. What issue would there be with that? Oh, I suppose you're correct. The hotel has housed a number of artists and scientists over the centuries, but, as I said, the masters didn't put much thought into it. It was just an occasional thing, or far too often a matter of nepotism, to benefit the master's darlings. Oh, Leo, sorry I didn't see you. Come, sit with us. There's so much for us to talk about. Did Cote tell you about the day's findings? We asked him to. Yes, you gave me a rough outline of what you accomplished. You helped quite a lot, didn't you? And here I thought this would be a vacation for you. I did help, but don't worry your pretty little head. Every second was worth it. Working on this was incredible. Leo, allow me to speak frankly. You have much more than the gold mine here. If you want to get rich, yes, you can achieve it with this hotel. I'm aware of that. This place has a lot of potential, that's for sure. Home is such a simple thing on paper. Food, bed, clothes, a ceiling, friends. But no matter how much humanity is advanced, we are still limited by resources and circumstances. Even today, children go without ed education, unnourished and ill. Even in the most developed countries, people die from rare diseases that require prohibitively expensive medication. The world is full of such inequities. With this hotel, we might be able to achieve an immense humanitarian project. You are thinking too small. Listen, the world will always have these problems. Every day a new poor, starved child is born and it will never stop. The more you help, the more they'll ask for help. Meanwhile, if you use this place for research, you'll advance humanity itself. Well, I'm already brim with ideas on how to exploit this place. We rely on gigantic submarine cables to communicate across continents. We could just relay it all over this hotel, for instance. There are so many substances of research which are prohibitively expensive to require, and here you can just generate whatever you want. Please, Leo, you must think about the progress of mankind. Astero has already convinced me that exporting goods may not be the wisest decision, yes, but research allows science to harness this power. Do not give in to stifling platitudes about power, Leo. Humanity has carved its way out of primal, brutal nature with our wits alone. Asterion told me there are such things as gods, he did. The fools allowed this realm to exist and yet did not make use of it. Were it up to the gods, we would still be throwing stones at wild oxen. It is humanity that created art and, with the aid of science, allowed decent living standards. Please, you must not leave this realm unused. Look, look, I, I know what you are thinking. You are telling yourself that I am German, correct? My country did such terrible things, I keep that in mind. The concentration camps, horrific atrocities are such a common sight across history. What Germany did, but look at what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
Think of Japan's Unit 731. Humanity is quite familiar with horror we are, but it's not mean we should stop trying to achieve goodness. Power is not necessarily corrupt, Leo. And you have power, lots of it, perhaps more than any single human in history ever had. Refusing to use it for good is not too far from using it for outright evil. Oh, I may have gone overboard there. I am frightfully sorry. I stare on. I had the most pleasant and fascinating day of my life with you today. I cannot overstate the privilege of learning about your hotel. And I am giddy to return tomorrow to finish our task. Ah, you've given me such drive, so stimulating. Oh, you think we can wrap up this internet thing tomorrow? Well, you know how a hotel works through contracts? I estimate there's five contracts we need to iron out and five tech schematics we need to finish to get internet up and running. And we're at four and one respectively right now. Well, that's perfectly doable. It is. Now, if you'll excuse me, I believe my boyfriend may have spent the entire day in our room, and that won't do. I'll bring him out to socialise with the others. Have a wonderful night, both of you. Master... What did Miss Greta mean by concentration camps? And what happened to Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Oh, Asterion. How about we talk about all that another time? It's a complicated subject. Oh, sure. Whatever you want, Master. I hope dinner's ready soon. You and Asterion sit down, get comfortable, have a short, pleasant conversation with some of the guests while you wait for your meal. Soon after, Kota emerges from the kitchen and begins serving ramen to the guests. You had a conversation with the dragon during the morning, and asked him to be a little more lenient with the guest's kitchen manners. Kota seems to have received the message, but he still makes strained faces when walking by some of the guests. Greta returns shortly after leaving, dragging Ismail behind her. The pair sit close to the bar, making Kota's walks to and from the kitchen longer as he does his best to avoid them. After he informed Coat of Asterion's cutlery fiasco, he connected the dots that chopsticks wouldn't do. Instead, he's prepared onigiri for the Minotaur to eat with his hands, a much-appreciated respite from the oppression of silverware. Midway through his meal, Asterion stops and sighs. Is something the matter? Uh, it's just that Miss Greta is quite difficult, is she not? Today I slipped up and mentioned that I used to play the lyre. Since those words left my mouth, she did not stop asking to hear me play it. So she got a few more people together to ask me to play a few songs while they depart. I couldn't get myself to tell them no. So, in two or so days, I'll perform a small concert for the guests. Are you sure you're okay with it? You don't sound too enthusiastic. I'll just have to get reacquainted with my lyre. It shouldn't be too hard. I've played it for so long. After your meal, the two of you climb the grand staircase and return to the master's quarters. Along the way, you have a small discussion about the day's events. Asteron is rather unhappy about having to take people to the bedrock of the hotel, but acknowledges that it's a necessary evil to get everyone else a better experience. Kota's presence down there has very comforted him, despite him not being much help with the task at hand. He also talks about Greta. You both agree that, despite being more than grateful for her help, she is a very intense person. Asterion mentions she'll be leaving in a couple of days to continue her journey. That still gives you plenty of time to complete your internet project. In turn, you tell him about your running with Ismail in the afternoon. The conversation needs to be constantly interrupted since Asterion has no idea what anime is. You decide you're better off not touching the subject. you have plenty of time to explain it to him later. The two of you reach the master's quarters, and after a bow, Asteron heads to his room. Exhausted after a long day, you do the same. Hopefully tomorrow you'll solve this internet issue once and for all. Had he been left in the cold room for long enough, would his body have frozen and his last shred of mind burned up? It had crossed his mind often. Was it possible to ever turn into stone? For eighty years he had thought, what if the next master was Clément's son, or perhaps a long-lost and forgotten bastard of Jean-Marie's? What if he had the dark features of Joseph from two thousand years ago, or perhaps looked like that Athenian man yet further into the past? Would another redeemer ever come? 
Asterion had built countless scenarios, crafted with Nardson's passion, made all the more vivid by the darkness and silence that surrounded him. That's all behind him, even if his bedroom is more claustrophobic than the cold room. Tonight the monitor lays on his bed, so small for his frame. The sheets covering him make a labyrinth of valleys and peaks, snaking and bunching up around his body. In his sleep he curls his fingers, shifting the cloth into a new spiral of snakes. He wakes up. Like a jolt of lightning his mind is thrown back into existence and he's conscious for he's even aware of it. What a night, as if he hadn't slept at all. No placid love making with a bed and pillow. Existing here in this bed of snakes, eyes wide open, is discomfort of the most mundane variety. It's then he says it out loud. Will I ever turn to stone? His mind, still in the reverie between dream and wakefulness, is assaulted by this momentous clarity. An idea pulls him out of the bed. For eighty years he'd been kept apart from a certain friend, one which he dreaded to see once more. But now it's so clear, so simple, what had kept them apart for so long when they were so close. Still in darkness, the monitor gets up and opens his drawer. Once he is dressed, he looks behind the rest of his garments and finds his lyre. Old friend indeed. His hand meets its surface like a firm handshake. The strings hum as the minotaur pulls the whole thing from its coffin. While you live, shine. Together they sneak out, two brothers giddy in their rebellion. The minotaur doesn't dare raise his hooves for fear of waking up the master or any of the guests as he makes his way down. Except for the stairs, he skates his hooves over the marble, making a soft whistling sound. From the skylight over the stairs, the moonlight rains down onto the minotaur. Were there a witness to see his descent, a blue veil covering him and the instrument cradles on his chest, there'd be no doubt of his royal lineage. He makes his way to the reception, then goes out. A dark sky greets him with only the shyest slash of dawn purple. The Manitor sits on the stairs outside and, without ceremony, plucks the strings. It's like two lovers kept apart for too long. Their touch does not yield a desired reaction. Brings no moan of gratitude nor spine-tingling shiver. As the Minotaur tunes both his lyre and his own ears, the embers beneath all the ash and coal resurface. A single note strikes true and makes his heart hum. That's just the first string. It continues with the tuning. Do you think I'll ever turn to stone? His lyre lets out a hiccup, a note so sharp it hurts. I used to like the idea I did, but this is good, is it not? The gods left us no choice. We are here forever, but were this our everlasting destiny, I would choose to exist. Overnight a sweet dampness settled in the asphalt below, and now it creeps up to the mind and then shivers down his spine. Back in Knossos, how many times has his bedroom door been left unlocked overnight, allowing him to rise before the break of dawn to witness the palace come into life? How many times had he done the very same thing in his hotel? One ought not hold on too hard to these precious moments. The more one grasps time, the quicker it escapes. If Asteron had learned any ex- lesson from his imprisonment, it was to let it all pass by, and hold on only a single grain of sand, just enough to make a pearl out of it, an everlasting memory. Nothing more is necessary. Footsteps creep up from behind. The Minotaur does not look back, but his ear flicks in response. Ah, the face Angus. Greetings, Mr. Walker. Did you have a pleasant night? Pleasant? I wouldn't say night can ever be pleasant if there's no one in bed with me. Oh, yeah, sure, it was some good sleep. The room's a bit dusty and smells off, but damn, the bed is nice. Ah, music, though. Just gold. Pure gold. Well, thank you kindly. Although, i got to admit I didn't think you were heart play, kid. You look too rough for it, you know? That's half of some really girly shit. It's not a harp. It's a lyre. Same shit, Angus. Asteron resumes playing his lyre. Mr. Walker, 
Could I perhaps make a request? You don't feel proper with me, Angus. Just say what's on your mind. My name is Asterion, and I ask that you address me as such. Oh, you don't like having a pet name? A pet name? Why, I don't understand. Your treatment of me confuses me to no end, Mr. Walker. What do you mean by all of this? What, you don't get it? I think you're hot, simple as that. I let you fuck me all night long and just go right to town on my ass. I'm a tough guy, you know. I can take whatever you dish out, so no need to hold back. And let me tell you, I fully hope you're packing a log down there. I... Excuse me. You want me to... You... Yes, what's so weird about that? Jesus, by your action, I think you never met a gay man before. What, were you raised on a rock or something? Gay? Yeah, I like men. Both fucking men and getting fucked. You know, gay. Fuck, you really were raised on a rock. You're from Greece, right? What kind of life did you have there? So, is this normal nowadays? Being gay, I mean? You really don't know, huh? Yeah, it sure as hell is normal as the best shit ever. Not everyone likes it for sure, but men are amazing. You can get all the sex you want. Being straight could never compare. Now, nah, being gay is normal. It's on TV, people talk about it in the streets. There's so much gay porn. I see. Well, are you? What? Gay, duh. It does not matter what I am, Mr. Walker. I serve the hotel. That gives me all the satisfaction I could ever wish for. Oh, so working as your kink, huh? Workaholic kind of guy, that's cool. I don't know what my thing is. Asterion plucks his strings and gives a sideways glance to the griffin. So, is that a yes? Good, so here's the thing that keeps me up. The stars. Look at that sky, Ang I mean Asterion. I've been all around, I know my constellations. I have a habit of stargazing, you see, and this night sky is like nothing I've ever seen. Then the stars of consolation I'm used to are there. It's like we're on some other planet. What's up with that, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, perhaps. This land is indeed no ordinary place, as you may have already guessed. But I'm afraid I don't know what to tell you about the night sky. It's been quite a while since I was last outside, and so I cannot for the life of me recall the constellations. I see. Well, do you know if anyone's mapped out this night sky? It is possible, I suppose. We've had a number of guests over the years. A few were quite adventurous and enjoyed exploring the valley. Perhaps they mapped out the sky then. But I'm fairly sure there are no official constellations. Now, does that task interest you, Mr. Walker? Interest me? Kid, look, I've no idea what kind of weird magic is going on here. Maybe it's a terrible idea to stick around in this place. But damn it, mapping out a whole new night sky? It's going to be just like going as a kid. But that'd take a long while, wouldn't it? I don't know if I'm staying here that long. I see. Are there matters outside which require your assistance? Ah, no, I guess not. I may look young, but I shove a lot of spunk left in me. But I'm retired. Still have a home to go back to. A little cabin. So yeah, I don't know how long I'm going to stay in. I understand. There must be people waiting for you back home. You know, Luke, you're much more pleasant to speak with when you aren't letting your base urges control you. Why do you act like that? Do you have to be so lascivious all the time? Well, do I have to? Nah, I don't. But it's funny, be surprised how often it gets me late. It gets me a whole lot of fights too, but I can hold my own. It's a thrill to it, you know, just let it all out, make my wants known. Whatever happens, it's going to be exciting. Besides, it's not like it matters anyway. People just end up forgetting me regardless, so I might as well make an impression while I can. Even you, I'm sure, forget me when I'm gone. No, I'll remember you well, Mr. Walker. Excuse me? I won't forget you. I have a very good memory, and someone as remarkable as you is not easily left behind. You're just saying that to get to me. It's something you can control, right? It's a charm. The charm doesn't work here, remember. I know how they work, so you'll have to pardon me, but here they're of no use. Perhaps that is something you should keep in mind. Whatever you say and do here, it will not be washed away. That's kind of hot. Why are you like this? 
Well, I may hold my tongue often, perhaps far too often. I have a duty and reputation to uphold, after all. But here it is just you and me. Why are you like this? Can't you speak to me properly? Surely you can, but you choose not to. Perhaps you are so used to being forgotten, you have no idea how to address others properly any more. Or perhaps you just don't care about what others feel. Hey, I... I do care, okay? I'm just a fucking dumbass. You better believe I care. I give the clothes off my back for a stranger in need. Yeah, sure, the whole being forgotten thing messes me up, but I'm... I am useless. It's just I'm not a piece of shit. Do you wish to be remembered? Yeah, of course I fucking do. Then you're welcome to stay here. There is much work to be done, and we're always in need of more hands. But, fuck, that dragon guy's an asshole. Is he? He seemed terse, true, but that's a very rude way to put it, Mr. Walker. But tell me, does it matter? Assuming Mr. Cotter is indeed unpleasant, are you saying you're any more enjoyable? Does he have to be, shall we say, pleasant? Is it not enough to be good and kind, even if flawed? Damn, I stare, and you got some bite to you. Don't give you some country bumpkin or something like I used to be. I'll think about it, that's all I'll say. Mm hmm. There is yet another thing. Would the people in this hotel ever forget the man who mapped its night sky? And as we start chapter 11, we will end the video for today. Thanks for joining us with Minotaur Hotel. And there'll be uh, another video coming up soon for this one. As I said, next one will be uh, Tennessee Shuichi's Route. And we'll see where we go after that. So I hope you enjoyed this one. It's the first video of 2021. Until next time, bye for now.